I read that it's Harlan Ferguson, student number 101133838, and this is assignment one for the uh, machine learning uh, class. So just to start right off here, uh, we just require three different imports. Uh, we're bringing in TensorFlow, TensorFlow. We're bringing in the Fashion M N I S T, and also PyPlot, um, just to show show some of the images a little better there. Uh, so to start off, we just load the Fashion dataset into memory, and then uh, and then I start with uh, labeling them one through twenty. Um, in the documentation, it had the imports as number one, but then all the other numbers would be skewed. So I just figured to do it this way because it's a little easier. Uh, so I'm just going to run this. And just bear with me whenever I go through this because I usually get a little disorientated. But we'll uh, start off here. So first we're showing the shapes of the different uh, train and test images and labels. Um, so the shape just gives you the amount of dimensions that you're dealing with, as well as the size of each dimension. So we can see here for the train images, we have 60,000 of them. Uh, and we've got a 28 by 28 matrix. And then the labels, we just have 60,000. And then for the test images, the same thing. We've got 10,000 with a 28 by 28 and then another 10,000. <clears> so that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then the length of those labels, uh, again, the train, we're dealing with 60,000, and the test, we're dealing with 10,000 to give us a total of 70,000. Uh, and then show some of the labels. Um, so it's labeled zero through nine uh, for the different types of clothing. Uh, so we have t-shirt, trouser, pullover, dress coat, sandal shirt, sneaker bag, and ankle boot. Uh, so with machine learning, as we've learned last semester, uh, you don't typically have the labels in as text or as strings. You usually use numbers and then associate those numbers with a string. Uh, so that's what's being done here for number three. Um, and then for four, we want to show the digital content of image five. So that's just showing what the actual uh, index of the image is, or to show what that Im image is. So it's going to give us that matrix. Um, so for this data set in particular, we're working with 28 by 28. So we're going to have 28 uh, rows um, with 28 uh, values in them. And each different value is going to represent a pixel. So for zero, we have black. For 255, we have pure white. And then everything in between uh, is going to be on the gray scale. Uh, so we just have this nested, nested array outputted here that represents that image. Um, and then for five, we're asked to plot that image. Um, so I changed the color so that we are using grayscale or else it gives you a bit of like a color heat map kind of look. Um, but then we just have this outputted here. Uh, so we can see um, that it kind of just matches everything we were looking at. Um, see, so like the first bunch of pixels should just all be black, which they are. A hint of something else and then some more black. And then when we hit this amount of numbers, that's when we start hitting into the grayscale. And then we go back to black, which is then represented here. Uh, so that's just it nice and uh, printed out for us. So I can close that. I will hide that. And then six, what is the label for index five in the train label? Looking at the above list. Uh, so the label for five is three, uh, which would classify it as a pullover. Um, and then for seven, so now we're showing index 500. Um, let's go down here. So again, we just have zero to 
255 in this matrix, um, just representing what this image is in terms of a nested array. Um, but to us, this doesn't really make that much sense. To the model, it makes a lot of sense, but to us, it doesn't. Uh, I guess a trained model would make lots of sense, but we don't understand it, so we're going to uh, plot that as well. Uh, so we get this image, and then we can see that it was given um, the same label as number five. So this is another pullover, uh, which is just like British for sweater. Um, so that's what we get there. So I'm going to close that out, and it's going to run a bunch of things. So we go to nine. Uh, what's the label? So I already said that it's pullover, and then ten. Uh, we're importing some models. Um, nothing too crazy here. Uh, for 11, we want to define a sequential model and give it a name of my network. Um, and then what a sequential model is, is it just generates a linear stack of layers, like what we've been doing in class. Uh, we're using ReLU as the activation function for each layer, and then we're using softmax as the final activation layer um, to give it the classification. Uh, and that's because softmax is good with uh, dealing with probability and then predicting out of a group of options which option is the most likely. Uh, so that's the basic layer we have set up there. Um, and then for 12, so we need to reshape the images um, or flatten them. Uh, so you have to give a single array instead of a matrix array. So let me just go to 12 here. Um, so we were tasked with doing what we did from the textbook versus what is done in the YouTube video that we saw in class. A week or two ago. So the, the textbook asks you to um, almost kind of manually reshape the images. Uh, and so we're converting that 28 by 28 to a single array using reshape. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, this is like a NumPy uh, method because Keras uses NumPy. Uh, so we just reshape we just reshape these like that. Uh, also, in my research, you can also just use negative one, and that'll kind of use all available. Um, reshape all available uh, training and test sets, which makes your model a little bit more dynamic depending on what you give it. Um, and then in the video, uh, he uses uh, the Keras flatten, um, and it's a little it's a little bit different than manually reshaping. Uh, when you do the flattening, it kind of happens on the model level. So you would give the model a 28 by 28 image as is without having to flatten it first. And then the model will flatten it for you. Um, so again, it kind of just helps with flexibility and allowing your model to work in different scenarios. It's a little bit nicer just to give an image instead of having to pre-process it. Um, and then we are looking on number 13 here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So now we're looking at uh, rescaling. So we want to have the numbers in between 0 and 1. Um, the reason for that is the weights are updated in proportion to the input values. Uh, so if we kept the input values in that range of 101 to 255, the weights would drastically be all over the place and it will take a while for the model to settle. Um, I haven't done any testing, but I'm assuming that means that you would have to do a lot more epoch than what we actually need to. Um, just to finally kind of get it at like a baseline. Uh, so if we manually divide by 255, we just get all those values in between 0 and 1, which just makes it a lot more manageable for the model. The other method of doing this is from the video, uh, which adds a rescaling layer to the model. Uh, so similar to what we just looked at, 
um, this kind of pre-processing step happens within the model. So again, you can pass it a 28 by 28 picture um, and it'll kind of handle this, this processing for you, um, which again, just makes it a little bit more modular. Uh, but at the end of the day, for these, these four steps, it's just like the two different ways of ach achieving the same thing. Like they still both work at the end of the day. Uh, there's just different ways of doing it. Um, I like the idea of doing it at the model level, um, just because uh, just the idea of being able to just give it an image off the bat. I think that's a little bit easier, especially like if you were going to integrate this into like a web solution and you would prompt the user to upload a photo. I feel like it's just an easier process, but again, I've never tested it. So that's, that's just my assumption. Um, and then for 14 here, uh, we're just adding some layers to my network. Uh, so we're adding some two dense layers with the ReLU activation and then one dense layer with the softmax activation. Uh, so now we have a total of six layers because we already um, defined some up here. Uh, where are we? Here we go. Um, but I don't know, like when when you called to define a model, I wasn't too, too sure if I needed to define all these layers. Um, but so I've just added more. Um, and let's see here. Where am I? So we add the software. Okay, perfect. So then starting at 17, uh, now we're asked to use a atom optimizer with the sparse categorical cross entropy loss. Um, so let's just go to 17. Uh, da -da -da -da. So we just do that. Um, and then 18, we're actually just going to fit it with 10 epoch. Uh, so we go ahead and we fit and we end. Uh, da -da. We end with a 38%. So very <clears throat> poor performance. Um, and then we go again, but we use a different optimizer and a different loss. So we use the uh, RMS prop and then categorical cross entropy. Uh, so we do the same thing. We fit it again, give it the same amount of epoch. Um, and then it actually gets better. We go from 38 up to 61, which is a, quite a good increase, but still not quite good enough. Um, and then for question 19. So comparing fashion with what we learned in class, which is the number mints. Um, so from my understanding, the, the data is quite similar uh, since we're using, you know, a 28 by 28 grayscale image. Uh, both of the data sets only have 10 labels for classification. Um, the flattening and normalizing of the data is more or less the same. Uh, and you can get away with using the same amount of layers, I presume, and the same kind of activation functions. Like I know we use ReLU in class and we use softmax in class. Um, so I'm coming to the assumption that you can use the same model for both data sets um, and you could get similar accuracy. But then on the flip side, the fashion minced is definitely a little bit more intricate, a little bit more complicated. So since the model has to determine a lot more different shapes and sizes, uh, you may have to add additional layers. Um, and then for 20, uh, so then 20, we're just trying to figure out if we've overfit, um, which I believe we have because the accuracy still isn't great. Um, so then I went and tried to do it again, but instead of using all of the data, um, I tried using 10 and 20% and it wasn't great. Um, so then I tested it with 30 and then ended with 40. Um, and then I just re reinitialize the model, compile it, 
I fit it and then print the test loss with the 10 epoch again. So we're just doing the exact same test but only using 40% of the training and test data. Uh, and then we end with an 86% accuracy. Um, so it's definitely looking like overfitting is a bit of a cause. Um, I'm thinking it's also an issue with the layers, uh, but for what it's worth in terms of learning from this assignment, I think it was supposed to flag it as overfitting, uh, which it was. So thank you for your time. Take care.